I'm at Aquascape's corporate headquarters today where we are going to learn step by step everything you need to know to be able to install your own pond, but to make it look like a professional did it. It doesn't matter if you're a first timer or a do it yourselfer. When you're done with this video, you will know absolutely everything you need to know to be a success in the pond business. Hey, make sure you guys subscribe because in the next video of this series, we're going to be going over the most common mistakes that guys typically make when they're attempting to install their first pond. Once you know what to avoid, you can make your ponds look like a pro did them, even if it's your first time. This is what this is the the elementary or junior high level of water feature installations, and we're doing it right here. So it's it's our waterfall basin kit, and a contractor could put this thing in four to six man hours, so two guys, two or three hours, and he's going to actually do it. So this is our sandbox. This is where we do our hands-on training, and so it's amazing the light bulbs that go off in people's minds when they actually do one. They actually install a water feature with their own two hands, and they see how it actually works. All of a sudden, the fear factor, the intimidation. If you can dig a hole, you can level a basin. You can hook up a pump to a plumb line and you can put gravel on top, then you know, how, then you can be successful with water features. And this is what we recommend to all of our contractors to start with, is the small aqua basin installs and master this before you move on to high school. This is gonna be a four to $5,000 install and it's nine to 12 stones and it will take four to six man hours and you'll make 50% easy gross profit margin. So if you sell for 5,000 bucks, 2,500 bucks in a day, easy. Or, or you can do what we do and do two in a day and make 5,000 bucks with two guys. All right guys, I want to introduce you to Brian. He's installed more ponds and waterfalls than anybody I've ever known, ever. So if you guys are getting into water features and you haven't done a lot before, one of the absolute easiest things you can build is an aqua basin feature. And there's a few different things you can do with an aqua basin. The easiest one is drop that in and put a stacked urn. Um, a little bit more complex and the thing I'm gonna show you guys today is how to build a waterfall onto an aqua basin. When I say a little bit more complex, it's just that. It's like another half an hour of time. The soil from the hole for your basin becomes the hill for the waterfall. We're gonna set this waterfall about 14, 15 inches above the grade of this, or above our grade over here. So if you're thinking of the grade in the backyard, let's just call this our patio. If all you guys can pretend that this is a patio right here, we're bringing that water feature right up to the edge of the patio. I'm gonna sink this thing down so it's about two inches lower than my patio. If I want to be the most profitable water feature installation company in the country, all that I would do is install aqua basins. Efficiency is the key, and that means getting familiar with your materials. He recommends sticking with the same material over and over again. On every single one of his jobs, he, tr he tries to use fieldstone and weathered limestone. Characteristics to it, a lot of flat edges. Often it's covered in mosses and lichens. This stone here costs us 275 a ton, where this stone here costs us 106 a ton. To a customer, we charge a customer 225 a ton for this, and we charge them 425 a ton for this. The main reason I charge them 425 a ton for this is I have to go hand pick every single one of these. What would be other reasons as a pond builder you want to use the same type of stone every single time? Practice makes perfect with that stone. Practice, you'll get better and better and better, right? Every single day I'm using granite boulders, I start understanding the characteristics and the properties of that stone. I understand how water is going to hug a granite boulder and then maybe leave a weather limestone rock because of the characteristics of it. If I have leftover, where does it go? To the next job. If I have a lot left over, I can use it on the next job because all of my projects I'm building out of the same type of rock. Remember this was my patio right here? I want this thing at a minimum of an inch and a half to two inches lower than the height of my patio. The reason is a water feature looks more natural sunken. So make sure it's always lower than my viewing area. Does that make sense? All right, then I want to come side to side. Pretty good, Ian. <laughs> Was that right? Yeah. Well, that's good that way. And that's sure acceptable. Now to plumb the basin, they pull it out of the ground because it just makes their life easier. Once they have all the fittings in place, then they position it and put it back down into the ground. So this waterfall kit comes with um, a hole in the side, so my pump's gonna sit in there. There's a bulkhead fitting that gets attached and then my plumbing comes out of it. So two things with the bulkhead fitting, guys, even if you wanna show them. You got the rubber gasket here. You see that thicker rubber gasket? You always put it to the inside. 
It's where water's gonna touch. It's the water side of any container. Okay, and you put your flat gasket here on the outside. The threads are reversed on bulkhead fittings, so when you put in your male pipe adapter, it doesn't okay, unthread like the thing. Uh, if you get confused on the job site, you put a little arrow on the bulkhead fitting to remind you. <laughs> Twist it this way. And this has that low water intake on it. That'll keep any really big particulate off. Anything else is gonna have to come through these holes. This is what they call an MPT or male pipe adapter. It's got threads on here. I'm gonna put a little bit of silicone that comes with the kit around the threads. Got it in here, then I'm gonna spin this in. The question was, um, does all this stuff come with the kit? 100%. The idea is that you do not have to leave the job site. If you had to leave the job site to get this little fitting, what happens to your six hour schedule, right? There's no way that's gonna happen because somebody's gonna go to Home Depot, grab the wrong fitting, et cetera, et cetera. As most of you know, leaving the job site to go chase down little parts is what kills most of your profits. It can make a four hour job turn into a six hour job. Shove it in, hold it a little bit. If you put it in and you let go, it'll come out just a touch, so hold it. Even give it a little quarter turn when using PVC glue. That locks it into place. Hold it for about 30 seconds and you're ready to go. You could technically run water through it after about 30 seconds. Let's say I'm visualizing this waterfall starting right about here. And I go ahead and hook the plumbing up to it and everything else. The problem with doing that prematurely is now I'm married to the position of this. Now I have to build my waterfall according to the shape of this thing, which sucks to do. What I'd rather do is let this thing kind of um, go through an organic process. I want to set a rock. Once I set that rock, let that rock kind of change my vision, let my vision adapt to how that rock went into, into the position on the aqua basin there. After I've set the next one, I might realize that this thing needs to go over here, or it might need to, might need to go over here. Let the, it sounds corny, but let the rocks talk to you. Yes, who's a good rock? Yes, you're such a good rock. Who's such a pretty rock? Yes, you're a pretty rock. Yes, you are. You're... Crap. Right, the rocks are going to tell you the best position they need to go in. If you try to build a waterfall off of a set vision, you will spend the entire day doing it. And it never looks exactly like you visualized, does it? You have a new aqua basin, all your components are in here. You've got your liner, your underlayment, your pump, your spillway. This is all like this, and then your pipe on the side. So this all ships this way together. Now this kit is the basic blueprint for ponds and pondless waterfalls. It includes absolutely everything that you need to know so you're not out chasing down little tiny parts and pieces and wasting time. What I've done is I've done some research and I found the absolute cheapest place you can buy it is on Amazon so I've included a link to that down below. It's where I buy my own kits. But there's two other things that you're going to need to be able to complete this project. And that's about 12 to 15 stones averaging anywhere from 18 inches down to about 15 inches in size plus an additional 500 to 1,000 pounds of three-quarter inch to one inch river rock to complete the project. Other than that, everything is included. You're choosing your frame rocks right now, Brian? Yeah. So what I'm looking for is a rock that's, this is, I've obviously got to have water come over this and it's going to drop down. So I'm looking for something to confine or, or keep the water into a certain area. I like this rock for the, the angle of it, the shape of it. It's definitely higher than this, so all that water should come around this rock and then come into here. And then we've got Ian looking for another frame rock on the other side. So you can see when I throw the level on this, it's super important that your spillway stone should be level side to side. Of course, if it's leaning a little bit to the left or leaning a little bit to the right, which side is the water going to go? Left or right? Sometimes you're doing that intentionally. You want that water to go a little bit more left. You'll see that in nature. For this small waterfall, I want the water to come off even off of here. So this side, without this shim in here, was dropping down. What are you using for shimming? So I'm just taking some gravel, anything you can find, some gravel, um, something you've dug up from the job site. So right now, all I'm doing is using this to protect the liner from this sharp plastic edge. Make sure I don't put any holes or anything in there. So this just kind of comes around like that. This also, when I go to start back, when I get that liner in here, but I'm gonna get that liner in here, then fold that liner back like this, and then backfill sand up to it. This keeps all that sand from washing back into that. So I'm gonna flip this back. 
making sure I haven't pulled that liner out from underneath the rocks. Now I take this, this one goes, just to make sure, like kind of like that. Oh yeah, protect it from the sand getting in. I just don't want sand to get in there. So now as I backfill this, I keep that sand from washing into my container. As I'm backfilling, I'm looking at my frame rock, or not my frame rock, my spill stone. I do not want the sand to come all the way to the top. If it comes all the way to the top, when I flip this liner over, my liner is going to be higher than my spill stone. The only way to hide that liner is put gravel on it. If the liner is higher than the spill stone and I put gravel on it, where's all the gravel going to end up when I turn my waterfall on? Down into here. It also looks weird. The gravel should never be higher than the waterfall part. It should always be lower. I've got enough liner where I can do another waterfall way back here, have it drop, let it run through what we call a little mini stream, or I can keep it up tight and have another drop right away. I personally prefer quick drops. It makes the waterfall look more dramatic. When I stretch it out, it looks less dramatic. Now this goes the same if you're building boulder retaining walls or any kind of natural stonework. Give it one or two flips and if it doesn't work, move on. This rock before was laying a little bit flatter. So I lifted this up, Ian got underneath here, then packed a bunch of sand underneath there. It creates more of a watertight area, so we're not going to lose a lot of water under there. More importantly, it raised this edge a little bit to really funnel all of that water in between here. So we did it with this rock and then Tommy helped me on this side and we got this side a little higher. I'm guessing with this being all the way down here and these size heights being you know, a good three, four inches higher, I could be able to contain all that water right into this area here. Now a lot of these projects are going to actually be viewed a good part of the time from inside of the house. Make sure on in the initial meeting that you step into the home and get a perspective of what it'll look like from the inside looking out. So a couple of the things Tavi and I are talking about is the difference between a pondless waterfall and a pond with a waterfall is this is much easier to maintain. It is much lower maintenance. The biggest maintenance with a pondless waterfall is adding water. Due to evaporation, you're going to have to add water. You don't have to worry about green water because it's moving and it really doesn't pool long enough to get that bloom. It's a great place for birds. You get the sound, but you just don't have the maintenance associated with the pond. They're, I would say probably at this point, 50-50. 50% are pondless features and 50% are ponds. Pondless waterfalls are gaining a lot of popularity because there's no maintenance. Let's be frank, with a pond, you've got to add chemicals, you've got work to do. With a pondless waterfall, that work is a lot less. You still get the sounds, but you don't have any of the work. We've got the last section of plumbing up here. I've got my reservoir down there. The water sucked into the pump, pushes the water up through the pipe. And then this is what we call our waterfall spillway. It's a unit that sits right in here and it accepts the pipe into the back. And so now I'm positioning this thing to figure out where I want this to come out. Remember when I said before, don't put this thing in first. Imagine how hard it would have been to figure out the placement of these rocks based off of a set fixture. Now I can take this thing and I've got some real estate with liner left here. If I want to pull this back, I can pull it back, create more of a little upper pool before it comes out. If I want to put it over here, I can put it over here and get a bigger rock on this side. So now I've got flexibility to play with this. And so I'm going to pull this up to here. I want to mark out this right here. And so I cut my hole to that size. Usually just kind of put my hand on the back side of this. It gives me an idea of where that hole is. The market left right there. Whoa. Got it? So now if I take this, take the scissors, and I can mark out a more defined area here. So what happens if you screw that up? Don't. <laughs> if you were to screw this up, good question. They do put a piece of patch tape with every kit. You would basically just go over that hole, patch it, and then cut a hole through the patch tape. Or move this over 
you know, four inches to the right or left. This goes right through that hole I just made. Then I take this gasket, make sure that's on there nice and good. Then I take this. I wanted to get a feel for how long I should be spending on a project like this, so I asked Brian to tell me about his experiences when he was doing a tour across the United States, and what he told me was absolutely shocking. We, we, we did a 53 city seminar tour. So you would sold 53 of them in how 50, many? 53 11 by 16 foot ponds. 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 Not, not po this, not but pond. waterfalls. Ponds. Pondless waterfalls weren't invented back then. Yet. Okay. And how many of those did you use heavy equipment on? No, no, no heavy equipment. The only places we used um, any type of heavy equipment were San Antonio and Miami where we used jackhammers. So you operated used, by hand. So you used the hand operated jackhammer. Mm -hmm. So 51 out of the 53 you did were done by using hand. shovels, shovels. And, your, and basic tools. And that was basically Greg going out and saying, I'm so sick and tired of everybody saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. All and by so hand. He, yeah, so he said he'd send me and Chris, we were 20 years old. I remember we were 20 because it was really a big issue for us to get rental cars. When you look at how many people can actually fit in an 11 by 16, 10 by, 10 by 15 foot hole, you can't get more than five, six guys in the hole. It's the same thing like this. You could put 15 guys on this project. It's not gonna make it go any faster or slower. Okay, so right. I, I want to make sure I got this straight. You did 11 by 16 pond, mm -hmm. 53 of them. Each one took you one single day using no heavy equipment. Two guys or three guys? Two teachers and a, and a classroom setting. And so you'd get at least three to four other guys helping you in that position why everybody else watched and took notes. One pond a day, five days a week, all done by hand. We'd cut up the sod by hand. What you, did you do with the sod? Did you use it? And We'd cut it up and flip it upside down and bury it in the berm. And But every single one of those projects was done by hand. I feel a lot of times the only thing that um, increases um, overhead is us. We feel like we need machines. We feel like we need dingoes. We feel like we need better trucks, bigger trucks, longer trailers and all that kind of stuff. You can run a very profitable business with a Ford F-150 and no power equipment. And we did it for years. We built, we actually built more ponds back in 95 than we are now. We just, they were smaller. So we built, I think when I first started, we did 106 ponds in a season, but they were all done by hand. Right, small 11 by 16, 8 by 11 foot ponds. Now we say like bigger rock is so much more important than like it just looks so much better. And this one, I swear to God, when we turn this on, it's gonna look awesome. I promise it's gonna look really cool. And so I think a lot of times we need to go back to basics. And back to basics is really what customers visualize. Customers do not picture crane size rocks showing up in their yard. We picture that, right? And so we try to paint a picture that these big rocks are more important than stuff like this. And this gives just as big as an impact as a four foot high waterfall. Foaming guys, really easy. Right now, if I turn this on, I'd be lucky if any of the water went over the top of these rocks. You see this big hole here? The water finds that big hole, gets down in it. You see this big gap back in here? It'll find that. This big cavern right here, it'll find all those areas. Way back when, um, the answer was to fill those things in with mortar. You'd come in and you'd tuck point this whole thing. The problem is Chicago or any Midwestern state or East Coast, concrete does what in the winter? It freezes, cracks, and then so every year you were coming back in to tuck point that stuff. And it was um, a big pain in the butt. The other reason I'm not a big fan of concrete is it's not very forgiving. If I didn't like the way something looked here and I foamed it in, within another hour and a half, I could rip this all apart, put in some different rocks and refoam it. But basically what I use the foam for is to direct the water where I don't want it to go. Never think of it as a stopping a leak or anything else. Water will still seep through it a little bit, but 99.9% .9 of it will go over the top of it. This is our foam gun, one can of foam should easily do about four to five jobs this size. So this will last you a while. So you can see, that's just gonna kind of fill those up. It's the exact same stuff as great stuff. You all know what great stuff is? The insulation foam they put around doors and windows? Black, right? right? Yeah. yeah um, and it doesn't expand quite as much as great stuff. Great stuff will um, almost triple yeah. what you put down. This goes about one and a half times what you put down. The reason you're tilting that rock up, Brian, is because you'll know that that water would go underneath it and not over the exactly. top and around Exactly, so it. I want to get a nice solid bed of foam underneath this thing. And when I lay that down, just kind of form around it. Trick to hiding that stuff. 
this works really good at a certain point, but I can take this, just sprinkle it lightly over the top. Rock dust from your rock pile when your rocks are delivered even works better because it's a little lighter than this stuff. Yeah, you can take right. moss, put moss or something over the top of it. If the liner is not serving a purpose, get rid of it. Meaning, if water's not rolling over this, why is it there? A rock sitting here will never ever look as good as a plant sitting here kind of draping over all of these rocks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, some small ones, sixteen to twenty stones. So every setting is different, every rock is different, so each water feature is a unique work of art, one of a kind custom creation. But the process to build it maintain is the same. Two guys can easily do this in two to three man hours, depending on digging condition. And then you've got a, new, a unique work of art, one of a kind custom creation. And if the customers are there, we let them do the honors. So let's give birth to a new waterfalls and see what we just created. Some of that sound. Hey, huh? <laughs> nice. And I'd like to point out here too. So this kind of shows the difference between using some soft scaping to hide your edges versus putting just more and more stone on the outside. So always do something to put in. It really hides your edges much better than just more and more gravel. What's more expensive? Stone that you use in order to use that or? All right guys, if this video has helped you out, let me know in the comments down below or hit the like button. My hope was by the time you're done with this video, you can go out with complete confidence and install your own pond or pondless waterfall and make a ton of money. That's all I want for you guys. And make sure you subscribe because in the next video, we're gonna be talking about all of the typical mistakes. Mistakes that my company's made when attempting to do our first ponds and waterfalls. After going to this seminar at Aquascape Corporate Headquarters, I got a much better understanding of what to do and I wanted to share that with you guys. Now next, we're also heading out to California to go to Logan Paul's house and do a really big pond install with Greg and his team. And by the way, while you're still here, go over to Greg's channel and check it out. He's gonna have a lot more tips and tricks on ponds and pondless waterfalls than I can provide because that guy is obsessed